we start with a break in the January 6th investigation. A major witness is going to testify. Trump White House counsel Pat Cipollone will go under oath. His lawyer indicated a transcribed interview, but his testimony will be on camera this Friday. Cipollone knows that all in this news is huge for the pro. He was witness to talks on seizing voting machines, sending fake electors to Congress, and was in the West Wing on January 6th. He has spoken to the committee before in an informal setting, but this testimony is under oath, stemming from a subpoena, coming just after the bombshell testimony on Trump's violent coup from Cassidy Hutchinson. On January 3rd, Mr. Cipollone had approached me. Mr. Cipollone and I had a brief private conversation where he said to me, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. This would be a legally a, a terrible idea for us. Pat Cipollone barreling down the hallway towards our office. I saw Mr. Cipollone right before I walked out onto West Exec that morning, and Mr. C Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable. Pat was concerned it would look like we were obstructing justice or obstructing the electoral college count. He warned Trump's team of, quote, every crime imaginable. And specifically mentioned, too, he was in that Oval Office meeting when Trump floated the idea of decapitating the DOJ to install loyalist Jeffrey Clark. And toward testimony, Jared Kushner talked about Cipollone's threats to resign. Jared, uh, are you aware of um, instances where uh, Pat Cipollone threatened to resign? I, I kind of, uh, like I said, my interest at that time was on trying to get as many pardons done. Uh, and I know that, you know, he was always, him and the team were always saying, oh, we're going to resign. We're not going to be here if this happens, if that happens. So I kind of took it up to just be whining, to be honest with you. Remember what Jared said. I was working on the other conspiracy, so I couldn't work on that conspiracy. Look, there are so many key questions that Cipollone will be asked, and they will go public. Also breaking today, another new witness will testify live at the hearing on Tuesday. Sarah Matthews, a former deputy press secretary for Trump, will go under oath and will be in the spotlight. Matthews resigned from the administration after the insurrection, saying she was, quote, deeply disturbed. The hearing will focus on Trump world's links to extremist groups. Here's what a committee investigator said about Matthews. I actually led the uh, staff part of the uh, interview of Sarah Matthews. I can tell you that she is uh, an extremely credible witness. She'll be able to help fill in some of those gaps uh, about what happened on the buildup to January 6th and January 6th itself. So what exactly does Matthews know about these groups? We know Roger Stone was with the Proud Boys on the morning of January 6th outside the, Wizard, uh, the Willard Hotel Insurrection Headquarters. New evidence revealed a meeting between Proud Boys and Oath Keeper leaders on January 5th and the evidence of coordination. The Proud Boys established a command structure in anticipation of coming back to D.C. on January 6th. The Oath Keepers began planning to block the peaceful transfer of power shortly after the November 3rd election. The night of January 5th, Enrique Tarrio and Stuart Rhodes met in a parking garage in Washington, D.C. There's probably about 300 uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound. The Proud Boys instigated the first breach of the Capitol just before 1 o'clock p.m. The Oath Keepers went into the Capitol through the east doors in two stack formations. And now Giuliani is doing another Giuliani under criminal investigation. He's back on camera saying this. They're going to try to, they're going to try to charge him with that, which is why he probably should have pardoned himself. Not because he committed a crime, don't you understand me? Because these people are criminals. They frame people. As Ari says, pardons are for criminals. And as the former SDNY chief Giuliani knows that. Join me now is my fellow Wahoo, Melissa Murray, NYU law professor, and Barbara McQuaid, former federal prosecutor. Thank you all so much for joining us to start off today. I, I, Barbara, I'm going to begin with you because I just, there, there's so much of this that I think is just sort of pouring out every single week, which makes me scream and makes regular people scream. We now have people backing up Sarah Matthews saying, look, everything that Cassidy Hutchinson said is true, what she talked about in the car, what she talked about. Uh, as far as the attack, what she talked about in the room, how important is it for the overall sort of 
legal case that may be left at the DOJ's door that we now have more people coming forward and backing up the testimony that we heard in the last January 6th hearing? Oh, it's very important. Number one, corroboration is very valuable. Sometimes people might think that a witness either misheard something or didn't remember it correctly or is even lying about something. But if you have another witness who can independently verify the same facts, that tends to enhance the believability about it. I also think Sarah Matthews could be an interesting witness, just as Cassidy Hutchinson was, in what I would refer to as a bridge witness. That is, even if she didn't see things directly, she may be able to lead investigators to additional witnesses or describe bits of conversations or things that she heard that can open new lines of investigation. So she seems like a very interesting and promising witness. Professor Murray, the next hearing, or it's going to be about sort of Proud Boys and white nationalist connections and everything else like that. What is the kind of thing that is sort of a definite link, right? It, you know, look, just because I have a meeting with a member of the Klan doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a member. Just because I have a meeting with the Proud Boys doesn't necessarily mean that I am directing their behavior, even if I might be coordinating. What has to be shown or what should be explained in next week's meeting to say, look, these people were in the room, you know, it, it's Clue, in the room with a wrench, you know, with the maid in order to make sure that we can draw this connection here legally and, and politically. Well, to be clear, Jason, this is a congressional testimony. It's not a criminal prosecution. This is right. not a criminal trial. So the standard of proof is very different. Um, this is just testimony given under oath. And I imagine what the select committee is looking for is, as Barbara said, more corroboration that there are actually very established links here. Um, if this were to go forward and to be subject of a DOJ prosecution for conspiracy or to link anyone in the White House to the charges of seditious conspiracy that have already been leveled against individuals like Stuart Rhodes, then I think you actually need to have some kind of connection, whether it's in the form of messages or communications. And it doesn't have to be a lot in order to establish that there was a there was some kind of conspiracy afoot. Um, conspiracy is known as the darling of the prosecutor's nursery because it takes so little to establish it and to link up a number of different people in this theory of group liability. So again, just links between these individuals who have already been identified with these extremist groups and those in the White House, I think, would be quite profitable. Barbara, we've got some sound talking about people being concerned about being prosecuted. We have some sound from Roger Stone right now. Uh, his thoughts about someone who's going to try and avoid future investigations. What's your thoughts on the other side? I think he announces sooner rather than later. I think he announces as early as July. As early as this July, meaning like a week, he could be announcing the 2024 run? Wow. Barbara, look, I understand that Trump may have an interest in announcing early so that people are obligated to pay attention to him so he can use, you know, campaign and PAC money for whatever sort of conspiratorial things he wants to engage in. But from a legal standpoint, how does announcing that you're running for president possibly insulate you from prosecution? I don't explain explain to me in the audience why it would make a difference if he's announced or not announced when it comes to being investigated. I don't think it would matter in this instance, but it, here's why it's relevant. The Justice Department does have a policy that says it should never take action for the purpose of influencing political outcomes. Um, and, and in some ways, they shouldn't even take action that might have the effect of influencing political outcomes. So for that reason, the Justice Department usually stands down in what they call a cooling off period for roughly 60 days or so around an election. So I would say if as we face primary season in the spring of 2024 or the November 2024 season, I think you would see the Justice Department cool off any investigation or any charges. But we're a long ways away from that. And so I think whether he announces in July or 2023, uh, I don't think it's going to make a difference in the investigations being done by DOJ or the, Georgia uh, or this committee. They cool off anymore. I think we'll be frozen. I haven't seen much heat <laughs> yet. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, I, I, I got to ask you this. One of the things of interest is Republicans have already said, look, if we retake the House this fall, we're going to start investigating members of the January 6th committee. They're basically already planning their own counter investigation of the initial investigation. The DOJ is not necessarily going to be any more obligated to listen to those results than they are what's happening with the actual January 6th committee. What could be the consequences, though, as far as information being shared? If Republicans take over the House, they shut down January 6th, could they hold information from the DOJ? Could they, could they snatch documentation back? What could be the real consequences 
to a Republican House takeover this far uh, this fall as far as this investigation goes? Well, Jason, the question assumes that the individuals who would be taking back the House would be institutionalists who would follow established protocols. Like, we know that that's already not the case. So it could be that they do things that are perhaps unorthodox, things that we haven't seen before in terms of withholding um, information, asking for evidence back, asking for information to be um, sent back to Congress. It, it's all very unclear. Um, but we do know that the fact that they are already contemplating the prospect of a retaliatory investigation of an investigation shows how serious they are and how close this select committee has come and how unnerving the findings have been for those who are outside of it. So who knows what will happen, um, but, you know, having that kind of power will certainly lead to some interesting shifts in how business is done at the Capitol. And, and I have to follow up and, and say this, you know, the idea that they're already planning extended testimony says to me all the more reason why the January 6th committee should continue. I don't understand why we only have two more episodes left of this more import, most important investigation in this conspiracy when you know that the other side is planning bad faith investigations all the way until 2024. It doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, Melissa Murray, Barbara McQuaid, thank you so much for starting us off on the beat tonight.